Hello everyone and welcome to Sun Up. I'm Lyndall Stout. We are on to the Tulsa State Fair this week, which is just now getting started. We're among the more than 2,300 entries by 4-Hers from around Oklahoma. And this is just one great example that shows the creativity of the young people. Today we're working on displaying all of the 4-H exhibits that came in yesterday and were judged yesterday. We're just going through making sure that they're all um, displayed properly and that they're easy to see for everybody that comes through the Tulsa State Fair. Kids get so excited to see how their projects placed and the kids work on these projects all year long and they get to take away the, the responsibility for those projects. They also learn the discipline of sitting down and doing all of those projects and doing them properly. And they, there's tons of life skills that they learn through doing these projects, but those are two of the big takeaway pieces that the kids learn through doing those. We'll have more from the fair a little later in the show. But first, Extension Beef Cattle Specialist Dave Lawman shows us how to make sure cattle are getting the supplements they need. Seasons are changing and nutrition's gonna be important as that season changes for cattle too. And cake calibration is, is something producers need to be thinking about. Yeah, so probably a lot of folks are already starting to supplement cattle. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing we thought we might just talk about briefly today is uh, calibrating your cake feeder. Most, most ranches in Oklahoma, or a lot of ranches have a cake feeder. So uh, I think it's a good idea every now and then, maybe once a year, to just check and make sure you're putting out the amount of feed you think you are. There's different types of cake feeders. Kind of walk us through maybe the top three. Well, I mean, the ones that I'm most familiar with would be a, a trip hopper like we have here. We'll demonstrate in just a minute. There's probably still a few of the uh, maybe older style with just an auger. Uh, and there's a few hydraulic uh, models around. Uh, those would be the primary ones. Uh, the, you know, a trip hopper is pretty simple to calibrate because you're just counting the number of clicks or trips. Mm -hmm. uh, an auger style feeder, uh, you're probably going to need to use time so let it run for 10 or 20 seconds to calibrate it for example and that'll be your standard unit of measure mm -hmm. and, and that's important whenever whenever you're actually putting out the cake because you know different times of year call for different nutrients yeah I, you know uh, you can't manage what you don't measure right and so uh, the guys think they're putting out six pounds with each trip let's check and see if that's right. Okay, so what, what, how do we do that? Well, I, I'll tell you what, I'll just hold the buckets. Okay. If you'll pull the plug up in the cab, okay. uh, we'll run off about 10 clicks and we'll see what it weighs. Excellent, we can do that. I got the easy job. Okay, I just pull I the think switch. you can handle it. <laughs> so, so we're going for 10 clicks? 10 clicks. 10 clicks. That's about it. Yeah, we're not going to get five in there. Okay. So that's nine dumps. Okay. We're leaking a little. Yeah. Inefficiency everywhere. Okay. So, so now we need to weigh them. Yeah, this is just a scale that we use, digital scale that we use to weigh our newborn calves. And so we've got it hanging on the back of the bale, the bale feeder here. and. Let's, we can see what they weigh. We weighed the buckets ahead of time and they're about two and a half pounds each. Okay. Let's see what we got in bucket number one. So 28 pounds on that, or 28 and a half on that one. 28 and a half. So between your bucket and my bucket, if we subtract off the two and a half, how, what, what, what are we looking at here? If we subtract five pounds for yeah. both buckets, we've got 51 pounds of feed. Mm -hmm. 
and we had nine dumps, mm -hmm. and so that's 5.67, five and two thirds pounds per per click. Mm -hmm. The guys think it's uh, it's at six pounds, so we might we might want to adjust it uh, the opening just a little bit so we can make up that difference. So they can round it off to six rather than 5.7. So what 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 are some of the uh, what are some of the issues that that could cause a dump to be inaccurate. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts up there. Well, it's it's raining today, mm -hmm. and so we just discovered that uh, one thing you ought to consider, you know, the first few dumps uh, on, a, on a wet, moist day, there's probably gonna be some moisture in there, and then you're not gonna get as much feed out. Uh, <clears throat> so the, this, the type of feed, this is, this is a distiller's grains, we call it a cube. As you can see, it's a kind of a poor excuse for a cube. Right because there's a lot of fines in that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you would anticipate probably the more fines you've got. Well, I don't know, it, it depends on the, how much fat is in the feed, um, how much it, it uh, bridges. Mm -hmm. uh, the more bridging, the, probably the less you're gonna get out each dump. Uh, and then the less dense the feed is, the less it's gonna weigh per click. Mm -hmm. So those factors would, uh, would, would be involved as well. Okay. Well, thank you very much, David. And for more information on, on calibrating cake feeders, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu. There's a concept in ruminant nutrition called the positive associative effect. And that concept becomes pretty important to cow-calf producers at this time of the year, when the uh, forage uh, that is growing out here in the pastures is losing quality as it matures or goes dormant as we go further into the winter, or as we feed a lot of lower quality grass hays, perhaps some hay that was cut later in the summer, and its protein content is less than desirable. Well, the positive associative effect comes into play if we provide the cattle with a small amount of a high protein supplement along with all of the low quality forage that they can consume. If you look on uh, this particular chart that comes from data here at Oklahoma State University where they looked closely at the impact of feeding a small amount of a high protein supplement, in this case cottonseed meal, fed uh, only one and three quarters pounds per head per day to some cows consuming 4% crude protein hay. As you see, the retention time, the time that that forage stayed in the room and was digested, was greatly reduced by the addition of the high protein supplement. And the uh, retention time was reduced 32%. That then translates into more in terms of intake. Those cattle get hungry sooner, and therefore they go out and either consume more hay or more standing forage. To the tune here of 27, 28% increase in the amount of forage actually consumed with the cows that got the protein supplement. And that means that they're getting not only a little more protein, but then additional energy as well. And those cattle should go into winter in better body condition and be better able to go through the winter in good body condition and calve in that appropriate body condition score of a five or six come uh, next February and March. I think this concept of using a small amount of a high protein supplement is really a good idea, a cost effective idea for especially young cows that you're concerned that may be just a little too thin as they come out of the summertime Perhaps we'd go ahead and early wean the calves, get them ready for a VAC 45 sale, and then uh, let those cows have adequate amount of roughage that's available either in standing forage or in hay supplies, but give them just a little bit of that high protein supplement so that they do a better job of digesting and utilizing that forage. That way they'll have a better chance to regain some body condition and go into the winter in better shape. The concept of positive associative effect is one that can really be helpful to uh, cattlemen that have especially cows that they want to increase body condition during the fall of the year. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner.
Corn prices are in the news again, and Kim, I had dinner with some friends from Nebraska the other day. Commodity prices came up, and they weren't too excited about the price of corn. Yeah, we've seen uh, corn prices drop, you know, on the uh, Chicago market, uh, 25, 35 cents. So the basis, uh, the corn basis, especially the old crop corn basis, has declined. I uh, read this uh, week that the uh, ethanol plants are telling producers and elevators that we will not accept any more old crop corn, only want new crop corn. Of course, that's hurting the old crop basis, and we know where that crop's going to go. There's a lot of it in storage, and that means it's going to go either for export or go in the feed market, and that's not going to help wheat. That's that's good news for beef, but not so much wheat. But there has been a little incremental increase in, in the price of wheat. Can we call it a rally yet? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, wheat prices have been wallering, but at least they've been wallering up. Mm -hmm. uh, we we did uh, cross that uh, KC uh, December contract price of, th of three dollars or four dollars and fifty cents this week. That was, I think, a monumental task getting above four fifty. Of course, we we've only a nickel or six cents above that right now, so it's not moving as fast as I'd like for it to move, but at least it's above 450. If you look at the uh, new crop uh, uh, July 18 price, you know, it's uh, it crossed five dollars. It's a little above five, uh, you know, 90 to a dollar under basis. That's giving us a, a $4 uh, to 410 cash price in Oklahoma next June. And last week, Last week, you, 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 you talked about the decline in yield in, in wheat. Can you kind of clarify a little bit what you were talking about there? Well, it depends on how you me uh, measure that. Uh, you can do a five-year uh, average or you can do a 10-year average. If you look at the uh, five-year average, go back 10 years, you know, uh, it peaked at uh, 2004 at 35 bushels per acre. Uh, this, uh, if you include 17 and back, uh, our average yield for the last five years has been 29 bushels an acre. That's a 17 percent decline in production. If you look at the 10-year average, it peaked in 08 at 34 bushels an acre. Uh, this year, it, both the 10 and the five year are at 29 bushels an acre. That's a minus five bushels or about 15% decline in production. Does that mean that Oklahoma producers should just kind of set out a year on wheat? No, I don't think so at all. I think, you know, we can talk in generalities. I can talk about the, the, the big increase in yields per acre in, in the former Soviet Union countries or in the Eastern European countries or what's going on in Argentina or China. You know, China's had an increase. What matters is what's going on in each individual farm and in, particularly in each individual farm. I think a producer, okay, the state average is down. What's each field's average? If uh, your average is down, why? If it's up, why? I think that's the important question we got to ask is, is what are individual field and individual farm yields doing? And if they're going positive up, why? And let's keep that up. And if they're going down, let's figure out that, that, figure out that too. So as we take all that together and we look at the markets and all of that, what what really is the market telling the Oklahoma wheat producer? I think the, the market's telling producer that uh, we've got to produce a quality product. We've got we to produce not only the, a product that our domestic flour mills won't need, but uh, the product that our exporters, that our foreign millers need and won't. And if we'll do that, I think price will take care of itself. It'll get back up to that 5 $6 level. We can compete in this world market. It's not what I've been saying is that we can't compete. Also, these big increases we've seen in China and Russia and Ukraine, I think they're, they're about topped out. You know, they didn't have the, the technology 10 years ago that they have now, and they've already implemented it, and I think they pretty much capitalized uh, as much as they can. Well, thank you very much, Kim. Kim Anderson, Grain Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. And so often on the show, we talk about pH and soil health, and here's Brian Arnell to explain what pH is and what it means to our crops. One of the topics I talk about a lot when it comes to extension meetings and then sunup talks is soil pH, specifically soil acidity. I want to take an opportunity and kind of break down some of the basic. What is pH? You know, why do we care about it? So the definition of pH is how much hydrogen, H, we have in the soil system. So in low pH, again, we have an abundance of hydrogen in the soil system. Now, the hydrogen itself does not hurt our plants, but when the hydrogen becomes abundant and our soil pH drops, we have a release of aluminum, which starts out as a nice and, and happy form of aluminum, aluminum hydroxide that doesn't hurt the plant and it's just kind of there. But as soon as we start getting a lot of hydrogen in the system, 
that hydrogen wants to go to hydroxide because we're unbalanced. It's heavy on the hydrogen side. So it actually starts stripping the oxygen away from this aluminum and we are releasing aluminum three plus. Now the importance of this is this is toxic to the plant roots. Plant roots cannot deal with this aluminum three plus at concentrations of very, very high. And so it kills the roots, it stunts the roots, and it creates uh, drought deficiencies and phosphorus deficiencies. By adding a product, by adding lime to the soil system and increasing pH, we then send the conversion back and we send Al3 plus back to the aluminum hydroxide form and effectively take it out of toxicity. If you want to go more in depth and learn more about soil pH and the hydrogen and hydroxyl concentrations, those links are available at sunup.okstate.edu. Rain and cooler temperatures were the weather story in Oklahoma this week, at least for most of Oklahoma. Wednesday gave us a view of how unfair Oklahoma weather can be. Wednesday afternoon, the highs for most of the state were in the mid-60s, all that green. Down in the southeast, in the red areas, Wednesday afternoon highs range from 80 to 90 degrees. And those air temperature differences showed up in Wednesday afternoon soil temperatures. Temperatures for bare soil in the red areas range from 80 to 90 degrees, like the air temperatures. Yellow areas were above 70. Soil temperatures were in the 60s in the green areas. Long-lasting heavy rain visited western and central Oklahoma this week. A four-day rainfall map from Sunday through 6 p.m. Wednesday evening showed where good rains fell across central and western Oklahoma. The folks in the blue and white map areas in the southeast and east had little to no rain. Mesonet locations in the green map areas ranged from more than an inch to under four inches. Yellow areas were above four inches. The rainfall came at a time of real need for newly planted winter wheat and canola. Wheat belt soils have gone from extremely dry to excellent soil moisture. Here's Gary with a look back and a look ahead. Thanks, Alan. Good morning, everyone. Well, after that burst of fall with the great moisture across parts of the state, I have good news and bad news for the drought outlook. It'll be easier to show you than tell you, so let's go right to the newest drought monitor map. The good news is we've eliminated some of the uh, drought and abnormally dry conditions across uh, northwestern Oklahoma, um, but the bad uh, news is that we've started to expand it even more down across southeastern Oklahoma. So we still have just a tiny bit of moderate drought up in Harper County, um, but we still have plenty of that abnormally dry uh, yellow across the state, and again, uh, expanding across southeastern Oklahoma. Now let me show you why. This is the departure from normal rainfall map from the Mazinet for the last 30 days, and we can see we've sort of caught up across the western one half to two thirds of the state, um, but the eastern uh, third, uh, even closer to a half of the state, is still well below normal in rainfall, especially as we get over into east central down into southeast Oklahoma. Again, that's where that D0 abnormally dry conditions, um, that's where that expanded uh, from last week to this week. Now as we look out into next week, uh, we do see increased odds of above normal temperatures, so our bout with fall might be over for a little bit once again, not necessarily up into the 80s and uh, upper 80s and uh, low 90s, but at least warmer than normal, and we also see increased odds of above normal precipitation. So that would be good news um, if we could get some more moisture in here. Unfortunately, the odds aren't too great down in southeastern Oklahoma. So as we go forward, we're going to need more moisture down across southeast Oklahoma to prevent drought development in that area. Let's hope we get that over the next few weeks. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Prescribed burns are an important way to manage Oklahoma's landscape. And to help you do them safely, there are some upcoming workshops as well as new tools available on the OK Fire website. 
Here's our fire meteorologist, J.D. Carlson, to explain. We'd like to announce the fall series of training workshops for OK Fire. OK Fire is our Mesonet-based program, which is for wildland fire managers. This includes people who work with wildfires, such as emergency managers, fire departments, or people who advise them in the field. Also people who do prescribed burning. That could be federal, state agencies, private landowners, and so forth. Over the past two years, we've uh, developed a new OK Fire website, and so it's going to be much different this fall. The current website is going to be retired the beginning of October, and so this training could be very useful for not only new users, but returning users, because the layout will be substantially different and the content will be different. These workshops will be six hours of training with an hour for lunch break. They'll be held at seven different locations throughout Oklahoma during the period October through December. It, it again centers around wildland fire, which is either wildfires or prescribed fire. So you will learn about what are the most important weather variables for fire behavior, uh, relative humidity, winds, that type of thing. You'll also learn about our fire danger model, which makes the fire danger predictions and how to interpret those results. We'll also have things dealing with smoke management. Uh, if you do a prescribed burn, for example, you're responsible for managing your smoke, and we have some products that apply to that. Uh, and you'll also be able to monitor the current conditions, and we include an 84-hour forecast that can tell you fire danger conditions and weather conditions about three days into the future. So that's a good planning tool, whether you're a fire department or whether you're contemplating a prescribed burn. It'll give you some windows of opportunity for your burn that you can see ahead of time. Also, if you're a fire department, you can see when the particularly high periods of fire danger would be over the next three days. Finally today, if you're planning a visit to the Tulsa State Fair, you may want to pencil in a little bit of time for the draft horse competition. Draft horses, because of the very nature that they're so big, they essentially also had to breed them to be very calm, nice horses to be around. So your typical draft horse is a very lovely horse and very kind and patient. Early on a Sunday morning, a truck arrives with a four-ton load at the State Fairgrounds in Oklahoma City. Within minutes of stopping, the cargo steps into the sunlight and onto the scales. The first set of Belgian draft horses, the lighter team, weighs 3,600 pounds. The heavyweights top 4,500. Jaw-dropping size and stature, awe-inspiring to say the least. We're at the Oklahoma City draft horse pool. It's in a split overweight pool. Uh, so the bottom, the, the horses are all weighed. They take the total number of teams, they split it in the middle. We have the bottom half of those teams will be in the lightweights and the top half of those teams are in the heavyweights. Owner Brad Brazil and team member Ty Hickman lead them to the barn where preparation commences. First up, the horses settle into their stalls and get water, feed, and hay. Some are more patient than others. They're friends with each other. Okay. They, they spend about six hours in a harness, standing side by side all day, uh, working. Make no mistake, each horse has his own personality and style. I'll start with the biggest horse I have is SpongeBob. He's, a, he's kind of a crowd crowd favorite. He's a super strong horse. SpongeBob's also a world record holder. The next horse, the horse that I pull with him, his name's Ted. He's a big chocolate horse. Very mild mannered, easy to get along with. Perky and Barney make up the lightweights. Perky is a, is a blonde horse. Pound for pound, he's probably one of the strongest horses in the country. He's, he's, he's more of the follower of the bunch. The other horse is kind of, Perky's kind of the leader. He's, he's very quick. He's, and he's just He's just a little more honorary than most of them are. They compete across the country, including the national championships in Florida and the National Western Stock Show in Denver and everywhere in between. And each time they go through the rigors of getting ready. Shampoo, suds, scrubbing and rinsing. It's almost time to harness up. The energy starts to build. They get excited. They're, uh, this is a, definitely a competition. They, they've been here before. They know what they're doing. 
Proudly into the ring go Barney and Perky for teamwork at its finest. Brad is the driver. Ty is one of two hookers who literally hook what's called a double tree onto the sled in less than two seconds. You drop the hook in and, and uh, they take off and get out of the way in a hurry. You have to be very cognizant uh, and paying attention at all times. It's massive, massive animals pulling a lot of weight. And so, yeah, you have to respect that. We'll pull the weight 20 feet. Once that 20 feet's completed, we'll complete that round and then we'll do another round and they'll add more weight and we'll pull that 20 feet. They'll continue to add weight till the last person's pulled it the furthest. Competition is fierce, intense and exciting. Yet there's still a spirit of community and support for fellow competitors. Barney and Perky give it their all, landing in second place. A short break and then it's time for the heavyweights. SpongeBob and Ted are ready to go. Once you've held the held the lines on one of these guys and and, and experienced the power that they have and 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 seeing them work, I mean it's 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 very rewarding to, to get to do it. But to be around that kind of power is it's pretty neat. Block after block is added, round after round, and in the end, they get the win. The crowd is ecstatic. More than 11,000 pounds for the blue ribbon. Just because you have a Belgian doesn't mean you have a pulling horse. If that horse doesn't have the heart, doesn't want to pull, you're, he's not going to do very good in the competition. He's going to want, he's got to, he's got to have the heart and want to do it. The draft horse competition at the Tulsa State Fair takes place Saturday afternoon, October 7th, beginning at 2. And that just about does it for us this week. One final reminder before we go is that the annual Cowboy Stampede Rodeo featuring the OSU Rodeo team begins October 5th for three nights at the Payne County Fairgrounds in Stillwater. Thanks so much for joining us from the Tulsa State Fair. I'm Lyndall Stout. Remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.